Hello everyone, my name is Michael Brooks. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Sullivan County Legislature. And on behalf of our Chairman, Robert Doherty, and the rest of the Sullivan County Legislature, welcome for joining us today uh, for our Town Hall event. With us is our Director of Public Health, Nancy McGraw, our County Manager, Joshua Potosik, and we have four members of the clergy today, and I am going to do my best to pronounce their names correctly. Uh, with us online, is uh, Father Bader, uh, and he's with the St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church in Liberty. We also have David Kuhn of the White Lake Reform Presbyterian Church. We have Samuel Encart Nassion, uh, Imam of the Islamic Information Center, which is located here uh, in Monticello. And we have Rabbi Larry Zeeler. Um, I hope I did justice to everybody's name. Um, but we thank them for joining us today. We thought it would be extremely important for the members of Sullivan, for the residents of Sullivan County, to hear from some members of the clergy and they can give, um, share with us their insights um, and, uh, and just how they've been dealing with uh, the coronavirus uh, in their congregations and the people that they speak with on a daily basis. Um, the way this is going to work today is a little different than what we've done. We have four questions up front that uh, Nancy and Josh will answer. And then we have um, six questions that each member of the clergy will be addressing. So we'll hear from each one of them as we proceed in the latter half uh, of our Q&A. So we're going to start today, like we always do, with Nancy. And the question is... What are the latest figures, confirmed cases, people currently hospitalized, people currently recovered, people who have died, and how many tested? Welcome, Nancy. Thank you, and good afternoon. Um, we are doing very well. We are down to monitoring 14 active people on mandatory quarantine who are being monitored. So those numbers continue to decrease. Um, we only have one new case since uh, Monday's town hall, and um, an increase of six cases over the last week uh, since last Wednesday or Thursday. Um, we have 1,416 uh, confirmed to date. No additional deaths. We're still at 47. 3,295 people have recovered. Um, only two people are currently in the hospital and nobody is uh, currently on a ventilator. Our dashboard has been updated as you can see. And 12,569 people have been tested so far, uh, according to the state COVID dashboard uh, for Sullivan County residents. And those numbers of people who continue to get tested uh, continues to increase as we reopen. And that's, that's a good thing because um, it's important for people to know their status. And so that's what we have today. All right, thank you, Nancy. Next question is for you as well. And it reads, can you give a breakdown of death by age group and a breakdown of age groups who have contracted the virus in Sullivan County? As you can imagine, we have uh, a lot of uh, records in our um, uh, information that, that we get, and it takes time to sort all of that. Uh, we do have an age breakdown by uh, age category in terms of the number of deaths. 55% uh, of the 47 uh, individuals who have passed away from COVID-19 uh, were male and 45% were female. So about half and half is slightly uh, more males than females. Um, in terms of age categories and the number of people who have passed away, um, the number of people um, over age uh, 60 is by far uh, the largest category. Um, so those in uh, the, the age category of uh, 71 to 80, 81 to 90, and over 91 are the, uh, the highest number of deaths that we've seen. Um, and we'll provide, I think, um, a chart that we will put on our website uh, or release to the public, which shows a clear breakdown. Uh, but the highest percentage is in the 71 to 80 age category followed by 81 to 90. So um, for the most part, it really has impacted the elderly. In terms of those who have contracted the virus uh, and recovered, 
And we have over 1,400 cases that we're currently analyzing, so we'll provide that information by age breakdown at a later date. Okay, thank you, Nancy. Um, David Kuhn has a question that he'd like to ask of you. So David, it's all yours. I have some friends who are afraid to come to church because they say, you know, in the New York Times, it reports that Sullivan County has the fastest rate of increase of the disease. And as I look at the dashboard, I don't see that. So I'm wondering if they are looking at something that happened in the past as reported in the Times, or what's your take on that? Nancy? So I'm not sure I heard the whole thing, but what I heard was that um, there's information out there from other sources tracking the rate of increase uh, in infections uh, in populations by county. He was referring specifically to the New York Times article. And Sullivan County. The one that talked oh. about Sullivan County having a higher rate Yes. The yes, what they do is uh, the, the rates are based on population size. Um, and so when you have a, a smaller population and you're comparing rates across counties with a different size of population, the, the, sometimes the rate can become unstable. So it's not completely reliable, but uh, for a rural county of this size, we do have uh, a significantly higher percentage of, of cases. You look at around, the other rural counties uh, who are of a similar in size, uh, yes, we, we have been um, challenged in that manner. So I think your question was to, to answer your parishioners if it's safe to come to church? They were concerned because the, uh, the, the New York Times reported that this was the highest rate in the state. Yeah, I think um, what we need to keep in mind as we reopen is our current number of active cases, which is very low, which is down to 14. Um, you know, we were at one point in the hundreds and hundreds of cases. So um, we can assume it's much safer than it was in March and April and even May. However, we need to be vigilant, um, put into place the mask wearing, the hand sanitizing and social distancing. Um, the Guidance is that, um, you know, it's, if, if you can put those measures into place, then we can keep it relatively safe for people. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is for Josh. The government center is open to walk-ins, but do I need an appointment? What about DMV? Joshua, welcome. Good afternoon, Mike. Uh, um, so we strongly, strongly encourage you to call or email the office you're looking to conduct business with prior to coming to the government center. Um, obviously, with things reopening, there's a lot of backlog at various offices um, from not having done a lot of um, processing in the last several months. So while we may be able to serve you as a walk-in, there's no guarantee at this time. So we, again, we strongly, strongly recommend call or email the office you need to conduct business with. DMV is similar, they're really working on a, an appointment only basis. They're, they're working through as they're getting some staff back, some backlogs, like we're seeing across a lot of DMVs across the state. So I think if you can call or email, we can get back to you. That would probably be the easiest way. And even in DMV, they're still using the Dropbox at the front of the Governance Center. So if you can use that method, that would kind of alleviate a lot of foot traffic in the actual DMV office. So again, just please call or try to contact the office that you are looking to conduct business with and that's probably the easiest uh, way that we can handle you at this time. We're looking as phase four comes to kind of get more back to uh, as normal as we can get to uh, pre-COVID. Um, it may not look exactly like that but I think we'll see a lot more people being able to come and get business conducted um, without having to make those phone calls. But for right now we ask you to make a call. Okay, next question is for Josh as well. When will we hit phase four? and what happens then? Um, assuming we continue to meet all the metrics w which we fully expect we will and I think kind of dovetails into the question uh, the, the, the clergy asked before is um, the, the data has gotten very good for our region compared to where we were while I think we probably were the Mid-Hudson a hotspot similar to uh, New York City it's gotten a lot better and a lot safer as evidenced by the, what Nancy spoke to on the cases and the active cases and the hospitalizations. So what happens in phase four is uh, schools, arts, entertainment, um, or indoor recreation is allowed to open. Obviously there will be guidance from New York State on uh, density, uh, social distancing with all of those things. 
Um, we are through the control room. Um, obviously, July 7th puts us after the, the important uh, holiday weekend of July 4th. We are actively working through the control room to, side, to try to get the state to allow some more activity, even if it's just for that weekend, and then we fully reopen on the 4th. So we're hopeful that we'll see more than what is currently open in phase three for at least that July 4th weekend, a very important weekend for a lot of businesses in Sullivan County. Thank you, Josh. Now we're going to start um, our Q&A. Uh, we have six questions for the uh, our uh, guest today, the, the clergy. and. We're going to start with uh, Rabbi Larry Zerler, um, Zierler, um, who is a re retired Orthodox rabbi that is living in Sullivan County. So, Rabbi Larry, first question, how did coronavirus affect you and your congregation? Did it shake or strengthen your faith? Well, I want to first say that um, life is with people, and uh, I think that all religious leaders would admit that and um, celebrate that, uh, and being is in relationship, as one of my teachers would always say, and I want to repeat that important thing. Um, although I think what we find uh, as a result of coronavirus is uh, that uh, the American libertarian streak is very strong uh, and that it courses through the mindset of so many people and as a result we are find ourselves in a very interesting um, what I would call a psychosocial but also maybe a socio-religio um, problem because on the one hand we promote community and community gathering on the other hand uh, we are in the in the face of a pandemic you find people um, raising their fences. Where we say the white fen picket fences make good neighbors, um, that's really uh, something that uh, works against us over here. Um, it's good, we, need, we know that the social distancing, and, uh, but at the same time, um, it's, um, community is very important. I know that I personally suffer from the fact that the social capital, which is something that is so important, to my life and drives so much of the human experience, religiously and socially and societally, um, has been diminished. Uh, and uh, the phone doesn't do it enough for me, it's that connection. So I would say that the people that I worship with miss each other, they long for each other. Um, um, I don't think it, is shake, it has not shaken or um, diminished my faith because I see this as a man-made as a human created problem. Um, this is a result, the spread or, or the, uh, is the result of hubris. Um, and I think in general, we um, have lost our control on globalization. We have built a world that has so many different facets to it, primitive as well as highly developed, and they came to a clash as a result of international travel, the fact that we have such a compressed world today we are so contracted but as a result of our being contracted we have contacted uh, this uh, this virus um, so and I want to say to the point of divine punishment I mean uh, this is not when bad things when society goes awry it's not God's fault we have to look at ourselves and and, and say that and you know, we're co-creators of the Almighty uh, that's the great command the Genesaic imperative and directive given to us at the end of the creation story that uh, these are all the things that God created for man and then he ends with an infinity to do so we are constantly co-creators and we are involved in what we call in Judaism tikkun olam repairing a damaged world um, the world we don't live on velvet we don't walk across uh, we don't rehearse for life things will happen we are it's all in the recovery we are all judged in that and we have great inspirational teachings and texts from our various faith communities about what it is to respect the other and to take care of the other. The good thing that comes out of this is that we should have a heightened sense of our need to be concerned for the other in life. As Abraham Joshua Heschel, a great Jewish theologian and philosopher said, uh, we are not all guilty, but we are all responsible. And by the way, that can apply to more than one uh, social phenomenon in life. And I'll say it again, we are all not guilty, but we are all responsible one for the other. 
And um, there's a statement in the Talmud, that whoever saves one life saves an entire world. Uh, so, I mean, these are important things for us to realize. We have been very ingenious. We have found ways to deliver food. We've found ways to reach out to people. What we haven't been able to do is regulate ourselves. That's where I lose my faith, is when people have obvious tools at their disposal and they refuse to use them. I'm wearing this mask even though it's probably not warranted. First of all, a friend gave it to me. It looks like a cummerbund. So, I, you know, I never thought I would actually be wearing a tuxedo on my face. Uh, but in any event, I'm wearing it because I have said to so many people, you got to wear a mask whenever you are outside and more. And I'm, I'm not, my, everyone else here, you know, is, is able to not wear one because we are situated. But because I made such a big deal, anyone who watches this thing is going to say, look, he's not wearing his mask. <laughs> and I also want to show off my, my fashion. Um, but the important thing for us to realize is that there are things that we can do that can minimize the risk. It isn't difficult. We have to get over ourselves. And we have to get over the fact that there's been an incursion into our libertarian rights. Um, it's amazing how many people, you know, also believe that this is something that it was a one-off. And, you know, it's gone away. Uh, and the magical thinking. So this is here where, uh, you know, there isn't, if you, I'm going to end with just uh, a biblical uh, parallel. And that is, if you look at the, the plagues that uh, in the Bible, well, there's a statement that there wasn't a house that did not experience a death. And, uh, you know, we all know people. So we've all been affected. I have known too many people very closely who have been taken by this. Uh, family members who couldn't get their chemotherapy treatments and died faster. Uh, other people, and so, ain't by chain shamet, as they would say in Hebrew, there's been no home in which there has not been a loss. So we have that commonality, but what we, the other better commonality is what we can do for the other. And um, I'll leave it at that. Um, um, at this, uh, uh, and come back to some of the other issues. But remember, being is being is in relationship. Thank you, Rabbi. Imam Senyuel, in car Yes. Thank you so much for your time. Um, as uh, Rabbi Larry pointed out, um, we have a very similar statement that if if you kill an innocent person, is as if you kill the entirety of humanity. If you save an innocent person, is as if you save the entirety of humanity, which calls upon each individual to individually and collectively seek the betterment of the next man. So I wear this because the law says that I have to wear it, number one. Number two is I'm 65, I'm liable to catch it. So, you know, I'm only precaution because God also says he does not change the condition of a people until they make a change within themselves. And that being said, it, it coincides with uh, my brother, uh, Rabbi Larry here. And uh, the effect that it had on our congregation is that there was a lot of turmoil, there was a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding because the congregation that I share worship with is comprised of primarily immigrants. There are very few African American, very few Puerto Rican, as such as myself. Many of them are Egyptian, Palestinian, Pakistani, um, um, Bosnian, or Albanian, and they believe in the literal expression of the Quran. It says that God creates everything. Nothing happens without God's permission whether it's good or bad. If something good befalls you, it's from God Almighty. If something bad befalls you, it's from the work of your own hands. So, again, God will not change the condition of a people until they make the change within themselves, and that means covering with the mask, social distancing, obeying the, the authority that's above us, uh, over us, from among us, which is uh, the American government, all the way down to the state government, to the local government, so on and so forth. So that being said, I spent a lot of time trying to explain these same precepts to the same congregation that I worship with because 
there's, there was a, a tinge of stubbornness. God is going to protect me. No, God says you have to put in the work. You have to change the condition within yourself. Oh, no, I don't have to. Well, here's what will happen. If you congregate after they close down all of the religious edifices, you're going to lose your permit. You're not going to be able to function. You're not supposed to be, you're not going to be able to operate. Is that what you want? Do you want to lose the mosque? No, no, no. Well, then you have to follow what's being said. So there was a lot of stubbornness, and it's uh, primarily by people who don't understand the American society. They come with uh, their their pre uh, pre um, ingrained cultural practice, which is in and of itself good. However, you have to adapt it to America. So that was the primary problem that we were having. And um, because I followed the governor on a daily basis, I would bring them the information. I would copy it. I would deliver it to different, uh, the different, the different imams all the way up into Binghamton so that they could understand the impact that this um, coronavirus or this COVID-19 um, issue was having on all of the congregations. So we have to be responsible and protect you from me in an effort to preserve humanity, and that's only by protecting me from you. <laughs> so that being said, it did affect it. Um, however, we came through it, and uh, we're following the uh, social distancing, six feet apart, where as opposed to being shoulder to shoulder where we normally are, we have six feet in between each believer, and we do multiple services so that everybody's accommodated because uh, we're not supposed to have more than 25% of the congregation at one time in the building. So what we've done, we, we came up with that plan. We have uh, the, the signs up for the mask. We hand out masks if, 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 if someone needs it. And we practice the social distancing. And, we've, and, and they've adapted and adjusted. And uh, God willing, it'll come to an end. Thank you. You. Okay, Father Bader will be next. Father? Thank you, Michael. Um, like the rest of the world, the, the virus affected us by separating us, by quarantine. God created us for community. God created us for those relationships. God himself, we believe, is a trinity of persons. and. We are stronger, we are more spirit-filled, and we are together. This virus obviously has kept us apart, and it has, you know, it's, uh, it's affected us because uh, we need each other, and I think we all realize that. Um, I don't know if it's shaken our faith, but I think when things are taken away from us, you begin to look for other things to take its place. I think, I hopefully think that our congregation has begun to understand that the church is not a building, but we are a church. And we are called by God to continue the mission of salvation, of, of kindness and compassion, mercy and forgiveness. And we can do that, uh, and we do that always, anyway. So uh, I think the biggest thing that has affected us has been uh, obviously being quarantined, being separated, not being able to join together and, uh, and share our faith together, profess our beliefs together, tangible things. But, um, um, but nonetheless, I think we uh, will survive, right? We get, everybody will get through this. Uh, and we'll, uh, hopefully absence makes the heart grow fonder. And when we get back, we'll be more loving, more kind to each other. Okay, thank you, Father. Next, David Kuhn. Hello. Whenever the uh, governor issued his stay-at-home order, that meant that we uh, met virtually. And uh, at first they were very uh, reticent to that. As we saw the handwriting on the wall, uh, some of our leaders were saying, uh, let's try and continue by maybe meeting outside. And then after uh, the news, uh, hit of some churches in various other places meeting to defy public authority, uh, we said we don't want to be associated with that. We believe that an important part of showing our uh, love for God is showing respect for the local authority, unless they're commanding us to do something that God forbids. 
And so we went to uh, FaceTime, uh, live streaming our service on uh, Facebook. And uh, we had, uh, I met and I uh, used my home. Our church at that time did ha not have a sufficient internet connectivity. And so we met virtually after the governor issued his stay at home. And uh, it meant an end to our senior program. It meant an end to our uh, youth outreach. It meant an end to our uh, Bible studies that even met in homes. Uh, our food pantry services over 350 families. And uh, what were they to do? Because it was all, uh, they've uh, fine-tuned it so that families are able to come in and get what they need from available supplies. Uh, it's, uh, that effort in itself was an attempt to uh, give dignity to those who were uh, needing a helping hand. So with this stay at home, we realized that the uh, food pantry needed to continue and so our staffers uh, reduced in number to a select few. And they packed boxes so that our, we kept our same hours. Uh, Tuesday, Thursday, the second Thursday from 11 to 1, and the fourth Thursday from 4 to 6, drive through. It's a drive-in distribution. And uh, they receive uh, their supplies uh, pre-packaged. And if there's uh, some special need, then they add to that from the prepackaged materials. So I believe that it has made our folks more appreciative. Sometimes, uh, uh, sometimes there's a phrase, uh, Christmas, Easter, Christians. Uh, people who come to church on just a couple times a year. I think that uh, for those who are taking the privilege of coming to church, uh, more important and valuable we realize that uh, believers around the world are persecuted for their faith and we face no opposition and yet people were getting involved in other things and now that that opportunity was lost because we needed to stay at home uh, it has become more precious and they appreciate it thank you our next question for the uh, men of faith that are here reads some people have said this virus is divine punishment or a reckoning of some sort. What do you believe? We'll start with Rabbi Larry. I don't see this as divine punishment. Um, this might be uh, divine directed uh, in, uh, and God has uh, provided us with a challenge, but I don't see this as punishment. Um, none of us are in a position to really be able to uh, connect those dots uh, and that becomes just speculative and it doesn't help, it hurts people. We don't need any more hurt there. Um, it is, I, I, I think that what is important for us to recognize over here is um, that um, we do have an opportunity. We have an opportunity, um, sometimes systems become so much um, in, um, you know, they become so complacent. Um, and as uh, the, um, Reverend said before, uh, people need to uh, appreciate that which they no longer have easy access to. How that is done, what is the uh, titration for how these things visit society is beyond me. I'm not a prophet. Uh, we have a tradition in Judaism that after the destruction of our holy temples, prophecy uh, ended and was given to idiots and fools. So I don't want to play God. It's not for me to play God. I would, however, say that who was a wise man, as we're taught by our rabbis, but one who can foresee the consequences. We're delivered something, and then we have to come up with the, the adequate response. In Jewish life, or in, in Jewish synagogue life, it's highly participatory. So it becomes very difficult for us to be able to run our services, let's say the way you would in a church, because you have multiple players. And that's why many of our synagogues have not opened up yet because uh, they haven't been able to. It's very difficult for us to get that model. I'm personally not comfortable with having uh, what is a makeshift kind of synagogue where people are, are standing far away from each other. I'd rather wait longer and do it right. Um, but what God, I think, or if there's a message over here, um, it's also a message of um, our religious institutions getting with the times. 
um, there is oftentimes through the lethargy and the complacency, you get fat. Um, there's an expression in the Bible, and Israel waxed fat, and it kicked. Uh, and um, I think the realignment, as painful as it's going to be initially for the people who will be left out of the equation, um, but the realignment and the reorganization and reimagining of religious life and uh, communal um, and social service delivery in, uh, in this world is going to be magnificent if we can recognize the opportunity that we have now to streamline, um, uh, to merge where necessary, um, to get rid of waste and fat that oftentimes creeps into certain organizations that are voluntary. Um, people don't always run their synagogues or their churches the way they would their businesses. And it's time for us to become leaner and meaner. And so if there's a message that I'm seeing in all of this, um, and it's not one that's welcomed by a lot of people, but I think in the end it's going to serve us well, is that we are going to reimagine how we configure our synagogues, our churches, our mosques. Um, we are going to look at partnerships and synergies. And um, in the end, that is going to help the social service dollar. Uh, it's just what you have to do every once in a while. And how, you know, there are wake-up calls. How, why they manifest themselves the way they do, I don't know. And I want to say, if I'm going to call this a wake-up call, I will say with a caveat. Whenever death is involved, one is too many. Uh, and you can't say enough of that. I find when some of the reports, well-intentioned people, they mention the numbers. And, they, and, and you have to say, and uh, 14 is still too many. Um, so, you know, I'm not happy that this has cost this country 120,000 lives. That is, in my mind, the part of it that went wrong because we didn't get into social distancing, we p fought back, we used magical thinking, we're not used to a finite, uh, to an infinite problem. We, let, we're, we deal with finite issues and we think, you know, it's gone away. Um, no, this, I, I, I'm not happy with the loss, but I am encouraged ultimately by the opportunities that are gonna be here for us to build a much more multifaceted community that's going to exist in various levels that will be able to deal with the shut-ins because we now have new technology. We are gonna have better parochial educational systems that have become very expensive to run because we're gonna think new models. So if there's a silver lining in the cloud, I would say it's there. Did God deliver it for that express purpose? I can't say, but that is going to at least be my response. Looking at this, what do I do now I, in ch I challenge people to re-examine um, re their assumptions and the suppositions about life. Thank you, Rabbi. Next, Imam Zahimah. Um, contrary to what um, the general populace believes, uh, some say divine punishment, we just all agree that it is divine decree. It was decreed that if we did not take care of one another, humanity will fall apart. It was decreed that if we did not preserve where we lived at, that will also become shambles. It was decreed that if we didn't water our garden, it wouldn't bear fruit. If we overwatered the garden, the fruit would die. If we overconsumed the, the, the fruit, we would run out of fruit. So divine decree as opposed to divine punishment. We recognize that the society has become promiscuous, permissive, lackadaisical, uh, uh, accepting of all types of unorthodox and unacceptable behaviors by way of the laws that exist in the land and the people's human rights to do this, that, and the third. That being said, uh, there's an old adage, you reap what you sow, and society has reaped what they sow. We abused this. We abused the ability to research. We lost control of the research. 
and here we are in a pandemic. So that being said, uh, the, 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 general, uh, the general community at large believes that it's divine decree as opposed to divine punishment. Even the movement of my hands is divine decree. At one point or another, whenever God's majestic pen wrote what was going to happen in this world, the movement of my hand was written down somewhere. That this day, at this, uh, uh, this meeting, on, on this camera, that Sam and Carnacion would be talking about this pandemic. So we don't look at it as a, as a punishment, and I don't try to forecast or predict or even try to imagine what the creator of all creation determines. I just go with what happens and I act according to the situation. And I'm speaking for me, not for everyone else. Uh, people have their own opinions and uh, they're entitled to them, but we have to work together, enlighten one another, embrace one another, uh, uh, start partnerships with one another because the one thing that I, and I, I might be jumping into another question, the one thing that I see that this whole pandemic thing did, it has restructured the family and brought them together. That's the one thing that I see that has happened. Family is more together than it has been before. And I work with young adults um, in the evenings and uh, most of them feel invisible. <clears throat> They have, they have no conversation with their parent. Their parent is either calling them on a cell phone, giving them instructions, or chastising them for doing something wrong, and they come in tired from work and go to their bedrooms and whatnot. They don't have a, a conversation. Not anymore. Today, they're having a conversation. And that's the one good thing that I see that came out of it, and only God knows, and I, I'll, stop, I'll stop there. Thank you. Next, Father Bader. God is good all the time. There's nothing in my faith in, in that good God that wouldn't even make me believe in any way, shape, or form that this is a form of divine retribution or punishment. I, it doesn't, that doesn't coincide with, my, with our faith in an all-good God. But I will say that, you know, in, throughout the pandemic, we have seen extraordinary examples of compassion, of generosity, of self-sacrifice that remind me of the value and the presence of God in, in people. We are created in his image and likeness, in God's image and likeness, and throughout this pandemic, as bad as it's been, we've seen incredible, um, incredible goodness. I, um, so, you yeah, know, divine, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't drive, it doesn't coincide with my faith or our faith in, a, in, a, in, a, in an all good God. Thank you, Father. Next, David Cole. We live in a world that is separated from any moral foundation. And in the time of Elijah, God sent a drought. The people would see the visible effects of their spiritual separation from God. And Elijah called the people back to worship the Lord alone. And they responded by recognizing that that heritage that they had, that revelation from God, was to be the very foundation of their life. In a sense, this pandemic is a two-sided coin Certainly God is not some kind of a capricious tyrant who takes the light at seeing in pain. There are too many examples from the Bible that remind us that God loves his people with a covenant love. He loves them before they loved him. And so as a dutiful parent trying to get the tension of wayward children He's allowing this to happen because we have turned from him. Certainly, uh, there is more to it on the other side. There is the fact that human conditions have also been involved in this. So it's not a simplistic uh, either this or that, but rather a unique combination 
that I believe God is trying to get our attention in a way like nothing else has up to this point. Our next question reads, how do you take care of your congregants and the community you serve? Rabbi? Well, you have to remain constantly in contact with people by whatever means you have um, and deploy the, um, the new technology um, so that people feel that there is a, a sense of, of connection uh, in the disconnection. Um, we want to remain together even while we're alone. And um, I think that it requires a lot more effort because you're not going to um, willy-nilly bump into people. You are going to have to seek them out um, by, um, by whatever means um, and, um, and become a good listener, um, which isn't something that a lot of people uh, do well. I mean, uh, but Disraeli said we have two ears and one mouth and we should use them in that, uh, in that, uh, in that proportion. Um, so um, I think that uh, the, there, is, there are ways to be able to set up systems as we have, to be able to have food delivery, to be able to have a sense of connection and show caring. Um, but it isn't easy. It, it, this, is a, it, this is a new science, I think, that we are learning. And uh, there are going to be fits and starts, and they're going to be, we're going to slip. And uh, I think we have to be good to each other and kind in understanding um, how difficult it is and the slips that we might make uh, while we're trying to be, build the new normal. Um, I just want to say with regards to God, um, you know, we have a lot of statements that in, in, in faith, and yet at the same time, uh, in Judaism, we have some laws we say, it might be the law, but we don't teach it, or we don't practice it. Because it's not always possible for people to be able to internalize or to accept. Uh, when you give rebuke, you can't give rebuke to someone who is not actually a good candidate or isn't amenable to that kind of rebuke. And sometimes better not to say something than to say something which is going to destroy someone. There is a piece in the Talmud that says that a person doesn't stub his toe on earth unless it has been decreed uh, from on high. Now you say that to someone who's gone through a pogrom or who's gone through a terrible uh, uh, physical violation and they're gonna, they're, they'll have more than a crisis of faith. They won't come back. I knew such people who suffered in the Holocaust that way. You have to be very careful with some of the things that might actually be there but don't belong in this situation. And so that's also part of the care, taking care of your congregants in ways that don't get too theologically complicated, that are not accusatory, that don't put the weight of the problem on their shoulders, but give them a, the responsibility to be part of the solution. And if we let everyone know that what we have over here is an opportunity to be part of a solution, to move society forward, to move into a new chapter, I think that people could pick themselves up from their doldrums and then they can be much more hopeful. You have to um, not control the conversation but direct it to places that are going to be good for the common wheel. Um, the question is how did I take care of my congregants and the community that I serve? Okay, it was a, a, a combined effort. It was a combined effort between myself, Governor Cuomo and his information, and the actual application of the social distancing guidelines. Um, it was education, education, education. We had to, I had to educate a lot of people that then took on the interest of learning what I was trying to bring to them as opposed to what they wanted to do. We cannot just do what we want to do. This was the primary focus of every conversation that I had. We resorted to video chats, Facebook, uh, uh, sermons were done online, uh, messages were by different, uh, ima different imams were posted on Facebook and uh, sent to each and, 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 and every different mosque and vice versa. 
in order to fortify uh, the, the application of the social guidelines and self-care. Self-care, you have to take care of you, your family, then your brother, then your sister. Together we can do this and, and come out at the other end in a, in a salvaged manner. Um, conversation, phone, uh, telephone calls, text messages, um, um, seeing a video um, on YouTube that referred to the pandemic or, or uh, uh, situations like it and sharing that with our, our, our next uh, brother or our next door neighbor and so on and so forth. So educating the people as to what the society calls for and what will prevail as a society that's all inclusive as opposed to exclusive, uh, which was the hardest thing that we had because uh, uh, people like to exclude themselves from a particular thing. So we took care of one another by educating one another and sharing with one another in, by any means possible with the exception of physical gathering. And again, what, my, my, uh, what came out of that is a tighter, more fortified family unit. Um, and that's uh, basically what we did uh, to take care of one another. If someone had a specific problem and they called upon me to help, try to help them, I would try to solution it as best as I could without, without pointing the finger, without uh, being accusatory, uh, just being supportive. And that's basically how we took care of one another. Thank you. Next up is Father Bader. Okay, well, spiritually, we almost immediately, we went to live streaming our Sunday service at, um, on Facebook. Um, then right after Easter, every day, Monday to Friday, we, I lead a morning prayer service and an evening prayer service. Um, and on Wednesday nights, uh, we have something we call campfire prayers, where we meet uh, up at our, my, we have a deacon in our parish, we meet in his backyard, light a campfire, and we lead intercessory prayer, do some reading, and then take questions from our, from our community, from our congregation. So spiritually, I've been trying as best I can every day, trying to um, to keep people connected to their faith and more and more and more and have a connection, a deeper connection to God. Uh, as a community, we've kept our food pantry open. We've uh, we've cut them not Wednesday, but Saturday mornings from nine to twelve. We've been able to, with a few volunteers, be able to keep our food pantry open and. Uh, and serve many of the people who are hungry and in need of food in, in, the, in the Greater Liberty area. Um, and I'm proud to do, I'm pleased and blessed to be able to both provide the spiritual and physical needs of the, of the people of our, of our community in Liberty. Thank you, Father. Next up, Pastor Dave Cooper. One of the greatest things that came as a result of this was people taking responsibility not only for their families, but realizing that it's not just the minister's job. We are members one of another of Christ. And it was great to see them uh, picking up the phone, uh, sending cards, letters, uh, doing things that they could, not only with reference to the community of faith, but to the people around them that were hurting. So that, that greater awareness was, was significant. And uh, I have to say that one of the encouraging things was the way in which the community responded to us. They realized that the food pantry was going to be in need. They were playing a vital role. Pe families who were out of work couldn't pay their rent. They, they needed food. And there, are, an, there was an overwhelming response from near and far of sending monies to help in that important ministry. Next question. What was the worst and the best thing that occurred in your community of faith because of COVID? Rabbi? I want to first uh, say that our community is not a monolith. Uh, even in the Orthodox community, we have multiple denominations of Judaism outside of orthodoxy i come from uh, we would call maybe the centrist orthodox perspective although i'm familiar with all of the different types of orthodoxies and the other movements so not being a monolith is uh 
it, it makes it very difficult. Um, you have cultural uh, issues depending on uh, where the community puts itself in that spectrum. Um, and so as a result of our not being a monolith, um, we've been very fractured. Uh, in, and I have to be honest, I, I think that it hasn't been, I mean, there's been good discussion. There has been inventive ideas, but they don't work for everyone. Uh, for instance, in the Orthodox community, you can't really live stream a service on the Sabbath because we don't use electricity. Uh, so some of these th uh, things have not worked well. We also have mandated three services a day if you're an observant Jew. So, and, and that's very much a part of everyone's uh, diet. Um, it's, really, it, it's really heartening to see how it almost became idolatrous, how much people wanted to go to this daily service, the daily quorum, what we call the minion. Um, the unfortunate thing is that it wasn't possible to have these services until recently. And even there, there, is, uh, there are differences of opinions as to whether or not we should have the backyard services or the porch services where you create your quorum by spreading them out. Um, some have said we still should not be taking those chances. And um, there has been a, a more than one uh, way of thinking when it comes to this. Um, the real, the casualties emotionally have been for people who are in mourning, such as myself. I lost both of my parents within t uh, 10 months of each other. My mother died in the end of January. I'm supposed to be saying the memorial prayer at all of the daily services. Well, I'm now 60 and I'm immunocompromised. And, uh, and I live with a medical person. And, uh, and she has to be at her post and we have to be very careful. And so I'm not able to, I haven't been able to go to services. I've had to substitute for uh, other prayers for the Kaddish prayer that I would normally say in the presence of a quorum of 10 uh, adult males. Um, the funeral situation which we've all experienced, grieving alone. I mean, you know, no matter how inventive, and I saw Zoom services and people come in and give, but I mean, when not to have the support of a sibling by your side, it's sad that my, my sisters and I have said of our mother's passing, um, we're glad she died in January, at the end of January, and we were able to give her a proper send off and a proper burial. I've officiated too many funerals, and I, you know, I, it's just been painful. I mean, they were given whatever rights they could uh, in terms of the proper eulogy, but having to clear families away from the burial, not allowing for full closure, not having the, the, the right kind of mourner's aftercare where you can be present with the person, um, I think those have been the real casualties. And, um, and, the, and there's just been the, the fact that it's been difficult to get a lot of people on the same page. Then they haven't lived with it. They've never seen anything like it. It's a new uh, quantity. And um, as a result, um, there, I mean, people think it's government's overreach. Uh, and I think we've been very fortunate in, to have a cheerleader like we have had in, in our governor. At least he's, he was someone I could go to every day for succor for a certain sense of like emotional uplift because someone was speaking truth to reason. Um, so um, and those are the things that I would highlight the most. We are not back in business um, the way we should be. We didn't have the same kind of recourse, uh, at least in the traditional community, to um, some of the modern technologies. Um, they are there, and they're great for educational purposes, but we've also had an educational overload. We've had Zoom overload, and that's uh, you know been a problem with a lot of people as well. Our schools have operated that way, but our synagogues across the, the board have not all been able to do the same thing, and that's left people with a hole. I believe that the worst thing that occurred was the inability or the difficulty at retrieving our departed. 
anyone that, that passed away. Um, we're not permitted to autopsy our dead. Um, we're not permitted to let our dead sit more than a sun rise, a sun down, and a sun rise. However, it can be extended to three by extenuating circumstances. People were being held in refrigerated trailers 10, 15 days before they could be retrieved, and we had to put together a task force of volunteers that would go and collect the remains and then take it and give it a proper burial. That's the worst, uh, uh, along with uh, my brother-in-law who actually succumbed to COVID-19 um, and not being able to you know, uh, say a prayer over him and so on. Um, the best thing that occurred is that people, uh, the men primarily of the Muslim community came to the realization that when Abraham was told that he was the imam, the leader of his household, it filters down to every man of faith, no matter what faith it is, you're the imam, you're the leader. All imam means is the one in front. You are the one in front of your household. You are the one that sets the tone for the observation of whatever religious practice you have to do. So on the, for the five daily prayers, I was the imam at my home. For the Juma prayer, which is a congregational prayer, I was the imam at my home because I have five children, three boys, two girls, and my wife. That's a congregation. <laughs> so I did the Juma service. So that, again, it brought the family units so close to one another. And extended families became closer by way of telephone communication and so on. That That's one of the best things that came uh, that has come out of this. The worst thing is the deaths and being unable to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Samuel? Next up is Father Bader. Mike, my first name is Ed, by the way, if you want to, okay. if you want to use it. Uh, in the, as a priest, as a minister, as ministers, I, you know, one of the one of the things that we do is to minister to people who are sick, the dying, and then be with families that, to console them at the death of one of them, one of their loved ones. Not being able to do that during this pandemic is is has been horrifying. Not being able to visit the sick in the hospitals and nursing homes not being able to walk with the people who are going through the, the, the horrible pain of having to bury loved ones with, with no ceremony, no ritual, no anything. You know, it's been horrible. Um, that has certainly been, it, it is a profound and deep uh, um, hurt that we have gone through as a country. And, uh, and I think we need to do something about it. Uh, I know I'm all of a sudden now we're doing services to for the people who have died during the pandemic, but that's certainly the worst. The best I can tell you, just personally, I, you know, um, being on Facebook and having services that are live streamed, uh, I've been able to connect, and people have been able to connect with me from past places where I've served. I've been able to, you know, renew renew friendships and acquaintances from from 40 years ago. It's been it's been wonderful. Um, we've gotten feedback from people actually all over the world uh, that have been uh, positive and wonderful and, uh, and make what you're doing worthwhile. But the worst, I mean, for, I'm sure for men, all the ministers, uh, just not to being able to be present to your people during the time of sickness and death, it's been devastating. It's horrible, and I can't wait till it ends. Thank you, Father. Next up, Pastor Dave Cole. I would echo much of what has been said in terms of the loss of physical contact, uh, the, the right hand of fellowship, the, the kiss of peace. Um, one of the saddest times was we uh, do a service every third Sunday at the uh, adult care center at Sunset Lake and uh, seeing one of the obituaries or some of the obituaries of some of the people there for whom that was the highlight of the month. And uh, not being there, not being there for them, to be able to share together, to encourage each other, was uh, 
Uh, frankly, we, we got as much as we gave through them. Uh, some of the best time, I'd have to agree with Father Ed in terms of reconnecting. Some of the people that uh, have been through our, through our uh, church family and uh, in, in some cases have moved far away uh, are reconnecting. In other cases, people who are closer. And this is just an opportunity that they're, we're thankful they're taking advantage of. In light of the time uh, that we've spent thus far, um, we're going to leave the last couple of questions off uh, for now. But what I'm going to ask is for each of our uh, members of the clergy that are here, if they have some closing statements they'd like to leave the residents of Sullivan County with, starting with Rabbi Larry. I'd like to just uh, reiterate the point that I made about being is in relationship and the relationships um, don't always have to be experienced uh, in, um, you know, physically um, close up. Um, we have to bear that in mind that people need to be able to have those social connections. And uh, social capital is something that exists in abundance. We don't pay for it. We have it. We all have a friend as a friend as a friend. We all can draw. Um, it's the wisdom, you know, of Robert Putnam in Bowling Alone. Um, but it's also a wisdom that existed before in our faith communities uh, that are all constructed around uh, relationships. And um, we have to m not lose sight of the fact that those relationships have to be uh, taken care of, they have to be cultivated, they have to be reinvigorated, and they have to be reinvented um, for ways that can actually uh, traverse uh, the expanse of space and time. My children live out of the country, uh, two of them married with grandchildren. Um, FaceTime has been and WhatsApp have been wonderful, um, but it's painful when you can't be with someone physically and you can't reach out and hold them and see them, but there's a lot that we can do, that we've seen that we can do. Um, it's also our use of words. Uh, I think there's a lesson over here in terms of language. There's a language of crisis. Uh, and uh, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, carefully uh, calibrated, titrated language. It's one that uh, has to speak to the situations, has to acknowledge the pain of others. Uh, very important that the people feel validated, that their um, anxieties uh, are actually acknowledged, and um, that you privilege people's pain. That is a very important thing for us to be able to, through those contacts, privilege people's pain and find some antidotal responses, hopefully, in our unbridled interest in those people and in our persistence in the relationship. So it shouldn't just be slapdash, but what we really need to do is be very disciplined in maintaining those relationships and careful to use language that is helpful not, I mean, the question asked about, you know, retrib divine retribution. God is uh, as good to all, as we say in the Psalms, and merciful on all of his creation. Um, we want to be able to, I, I need to hold on to my personal God. I don't want to live with one that, you know, came, did, and left. Um, I, I want to be able to feel an organic experience. So with my, my faith community and with my co-religionists, um, and I also um, hope that people will eventually open up more to the new normal. And, and I understand that we're in it for the long run. This is a two-year project. People don't like to hear that, but by all, speak to the people who are in the know about know what we don't know and they, because we don't know enough, and until we get a, a vaccine and create herd immunity, we really have to settle in with all of these devices, tactics, and, and do the best work we can to create a, a, um, a what I would call a virtual society that has emotions. Uh, it almost seems like an oxymoron, but a virtual society that breathes, that's organic. How do you create an organic virtual society? That's the task at hand. Thank you, Rabbi. Mom? Briefly, I'd like to say, leave Sullivan County with a suggestion. One is 
we can and we will. Two is, we're in this together, we'll get out of it together. Three is, there's no hate, there's no room for hate in Sullivan County. So, remember the song of the Beatles. We all live in a yellow submarine. Protect your yellow submarine, and your yellow submarine will protect you because we're all part of this together. Thank you, Miles. Father? Yeah, uh, well, just to quickly, uh, church is who we are, not where we go. And hopefully, during these last three months, we've seen incredible examples of people who live out that faith, uh, live out their gifts, their talents that have been give, God given, generosity, self sacrifice, putting others first. There have also been examples of selfishness and arrogance and belligerence. I would hope that as a, as a people, we would be able to distinguish what makes us a better people, what makes us church, and, 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 do, and do those things, those, those virtues that make us and, and the world a better place. Thank you, Father. Pastor? I would urge you to remember that we are created at our heart spiritual beings for a relationship with God, a relationship with God that has been affected by many things. And as we are doing, experiencing, seeking new beginnings, that new beginnings involves a restored relationship with God through listening to the revelation he has given us in the Holy Scriptures. and as we are reaching out to each other, maybe we can find that common ground in our humanity created in the image of God. And with that, I'd like to thank our county manager, Josh, for joining us today, our director of public health, Nancy uh, McGraw, for joining us. And I'm gonna be informal for a minute. I wanna thank Larry, Samuel, Ed, 